What's going on everybody and welcome back to the channel. Over the past year, I really haven't left my room that much and I spent a lot of my time messing around with Unity. I've made a good amount of games in a variety of genres and each one taught me something new and valuable and I've had a lot of fun with each one. I really do love Unity and I plan to use Unity for most of my games going forward. However, at some point I did start to crave a deeper understanding of how games really work. You may be wondering why I wouldn't get that level of understanding by just programming and making games in Unity. See, Unity is a game engine, so by design it abstracts or conceals a lot of the fundamental operations that make games possible. In Unity, you can drag and drop 3D models or seamlessly incorporate gravity into your game, but you really don't gain an understanding of how this functionality is created. I ultimately decided that I wanted to get a better understanding of Unity and game engines like it, and to do so, I was going to create a game engine myself. Now this isn't going to be something to compete with the likes of Unity or Unreal, it's just an educational experience for me to learn more about how games work at a fundamental level. After doing some research, I decided I wanted to start with graphics, because you really can't have a video game without video. This led me to OpenGL, which is a specification that defines functions for interacting with graphics and images. OpenGL defines what its functions should input and output, but it's ultimately up to the graphics card manufacturers to define their specific version of OpenGL. This is because OpenGL functions are directly interfacing with the graphics card, so it's going to be different depending on what device you have. At its core, OpenGL is just a state machine. It's a collection of variables and objects that define what is rendered onto the screen and how. For example, OpenGL can be set to draw with lines or triangles, and a drawing window in OpenGL can have a predefined size and color palette. After retrieving the right OpenGL version for my graphics card and creating a window, I started with the hello world of OpenGL, making a triangle. It sounds simple enough, but creating a triangle is actually one of the hardest learning curves to get over when learning OpenGL. So let's break it down. At the highest level, there's the graphics pipeline, which takes 3D coordinates and maps them to 2D coordinates, which then are mapped to pixels on the screen. The first input to the graphics pipeline are vertices, which are a collection of data per 3D coordinate. Two common data values within a vertex would be position and color. The main steps of the graphics pipeline involve manipulating vertices, assembling the vertices into shapes, mapping the shapes into pixels, computing the final pixel color based on color attributes, and applying opacity or transparency and checking for depth. Depth checking ensures that certain surfaces don't render onto the screen when blocked by others. You can control certain parts of the graphics pipeline using shaders, which are tiny programs that run on the graphics card. The two most commonly used shaders are vertex shaders, which manipulate vertices, and fragment shaders, which apply the final color to the pixel. The output of the vertex shader would be an input into the fragment shader. Vertices themselves are stored in what we call buffer objects on the GPU's memory. These buffer objects not only store vertex data, but how the data should be managed. For example, if a vertex buffer is changed a lot, you might want to store it as dynamic so that it can be used for quicker writes. Because these buffers are on the GPU, shaders have quick access to vertex information. This is what a buffer object that stores position and color would look like. It would have six bytes for each vertex, XYZ and RGB. However, OpenGL doesn't just naturally know how our buffer objects are structured. We tell OpenGL how to interpret our buffers using vertex array objects. Each VAO has a list of attribute pointers, like color or position, that specify how to read the values from a VBO. Each attribute stores a stride, offset, and size relative to the vertex buffer object. The stride would be the distance between corresponding elements, the offset would be the distance to the first occurrence of the attribute, and the size would be the size of the attribute in the buffer. Put simply, vertex buffer objects store the data, vertex array objects show how to read the data, and shaders process the data. The only thing left is to bind to these components and tell OpenGL to draw with triangles. To make the triangle a bit more interesting, we can play around with the vertex and fragment shaders. Here you can see a simple vertex shader and a simple fragment shader. This location zero reference just refers to the location of the position attribute in the array object. Like was mentioned earlier, the output of the vertex shader here is being inputted into the fragment shader. In the vertex shader, the GL position variable refers to the final position of that vertex. Right now, we're just hard coding it to whatever position is inputted, but that position can be transformed in different ways. We're also not manipulating the color at all, so whatever color is inputted into the vertex shader is going to be set as the final color in the fragment shader. 
using these shaders, I defined a different color for each vertex, which allowed OpenGL to interpolate the color of each pixel between those vertices. We can take this even further though. Position and color aren't the only attributes you can define in OpenGL. Using OpenGL, you can read textures from images and assign the texture coordinates to vertex data. Texture coordinates range from zero to one on both the X and Y axis, and are assigned as attributes in vertex array objects just like color or position would be. Textures will render on the screen based on where their coordinates have been assigned. Using OpenGL, you also have a lot of control of how textures are sampled. Using the nearest neighbor approach would give you the color of the pixel closest to the sampled coordinate, whereas the linear approach would give you an average of all surrounding pixels. You can even mix textures, which I ended up having a lot of fun with. Now, what if we wanna move the things that we draw on the screen using OpenGL? For example, in a game, you would need to move your player around. Do we have to reassign the vertex buffer objects every single frame? Luckily for us and our computers, we do not have to do that because we have matrix transformations. Using matrix multiplication, we can translate, scale, or rotate our vertices however we want without having to change their values in the vertex buffer. These are the types of transformations that would be performed in the vertex shader. Matrices are used everywhere in the world of graphics. Within the graphics pipeline, vertices are also multiplied by projection matrices to scale down vertices that are really far away from the user perspective. This really helps to differentiate the objects that are far away versus the objects that are up close. Using matrix transformations, we can even simulate a first person camera. We just have to rotate and translate each object in the scene relative to any mouse scrolls and movement inputs given. With all this information, I was able to render a few cubes on the screen and move throughout the environment. I was definitely starting to lay the groundwork for a really good graphic system in my game engine. And I truly couldn't have gotten this far without the help of the resources over at learnopengl.com by Joey DeVries. If you're interested in learning OpenGL, this is your go-to source. I'm looking forward to sharing more about my game engine in the coming weeks, so be sure to stay tuned. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Slow.